two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for Thursday, September 16th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pastor? Present. Mr. Rothman? Present. Ms. Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Mack? Here. Mr. Thomas? Present. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Ms. Cox, now please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Elmendor? Dr. Perandozzi? Present. And I think we have Mr. Wade Kearns as well. I think Wade's at the Equity Committee meeting. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, could, uh, I know Dr. Holmes is trying to join. Uh, Jim, he's, he's getting a screen that says waiting for others to join. Is that the wrong link, maybe? Uh, yes. Yes, Dr. McComas, I, if he if you tell him to uh, um, if you tell him to leave that meeting, I'll send him a team's request from this meeting. OK, OK. Could you also send it to D Doug Elmendorf? He to uh, couldn't get in. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. McComas, for that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cox, as well, again. Uh, now, if you will please call and note the names of all staff members participating in this meeting who might not be per presenting or participating. We have Ms. Pa Paula Boinkin. Uh, Present. And that's all we have for today. All righty. I'm sorry. Did someone say something? Okay. Thank you. All righty. Uh, committee chairs will, um, as we've been doing, ask that um, you announce committee members that you give your name uh, when you speak and acknowledge, um, we're small, just acknowledge, raise your hand on screen if you have a question or comment. Alrighty, I first um, want to thank everyone for being present today. And Dr. McComas, I want to thank you in looking over the agenda. I appreciate 
that you've given us a uh, link so we can get some of the background as requested at a previous meeting. So thank you. So with that, I'm going to call on, uh, unless Dr. McComas has anything else that she wants to share, Dr. Parandozzi and Ms. Boykin uh, for the presentation and approval for the speech, occupational, and physical therapy services. Thank you very much and good afternoon, board members, um, our community, and our BCPS team colleagues. Um, the next slide will show on this contract. And so the information here we did, we had to just to note that we did have two contracts coming, but just recently in the last um, day or two, one of those contracts has been retracted. Apparently the organization was not ready to move forward with that second contract. So this will be our only contract moving forward today. And the information provided here really is a contract. It's a contract renewal for services of speech language pathology, occupational therapy and physical therapy services that provide instructional and therapy services to ensure that of course our youngest learners receiving infants and toddlers services that they maintain those services when there may be an interruption or an additional um, significant increase in hours um, of services that come through. Sometimes we have long term vacancies or leaves that occur and so our services are provided for children from birth to five uh, that are non school based setting. These are our children that receive services in homes, community preschools. We do service them in the library. Some of our child find assessment centers we do provide. Um, this does is also encompassed within this contract. Uh, this contract allows us to maintain our Part C indicators, which is our federal and state requirement guidelines. This is how we are. Let's call it graded, so to speak. They are our requirements that indicate that we must do service delivery in a timely manner once they go through that assessment process. And we are also um, monitored on a 45 day placement for referrals. So once they are assessed, they must be placed and services must be provided. So this this additional service or these additional support services that are provided through this contract allows us to meet those two indicators according to the state requirements. And as you see, we have referrals and we've increased in our referrals and service hours over the years. Um, we've gone up and down a little bit lower last year due to the pandemic. However, we've increased over time periodically. Um, the support of our office of the Office of Birth to Five and the Department of Special Education does continually support this contract and those providers as they coach um, services to families and caregivers. They, we support the so scope and sequence of all of the providers through the family. And again, this is a required, all the services are required through our fate and federal and state mandate. And then I can, of course, we can as a team answer any questions you may have. Committee I'm members, I'm, I'm sorry, committee members, are there any questions? Raise your hand for me, please, if you can. Ms. Mack. Well, I actually have a comment. Um, I recently became a foster parent, a backup foster parent to a child who received services through this program and um it has made you know there's like he, he gets a lot of services so collectively they are making a huge difference in his life um so i appreciate this but i do have a question um and i was trying to find it and unfortunately i can't in the public works um 756 page report there was a reference to outsourcing services that we, sh we could save money by utilizing in-house um, staff. And I, I can't remember if this was one of the recommendations for using in-house in -house speech language, pathologist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, and other intervention services. Has there been any discussion about that? Absolutely, so thank you for that question. So let me um, add, add to the, not only the, the discussion of that con contractual services, 
these services are in addition to above and beyond. We actually service or um, have in our staff, we have 26.9 actually staff members in speech and language therapists, occupational therapists. We have 10, uh, it's 10.7, you know, we have um, persons that are part time in the infants and toddlers program and physical therapist 10. This is in addition to, so if someone goes on long-term leave, we will utilize this contract to provide services so that they are uninterrupted. They are not in lieu of our own staff. So our own staff provide services first and foremost. We also believe that the consistency within our model and within our system is better for our students and that provides that consistency of the level of service within that model and maintaining both the indicators and our compliance much better when they follow that process and procedure within BCPS. So we believe the same as well. So I think what I hear you saying is that these are backup providers they are they are in addition to so if we have additional hours if we are short if our staff is already at a maximum capacity of their case load and we are there's additional referrals that come in we cannot delay according to the law so we no, will contract service right so we will then seek to contract services to get that immediately immediate assessment or service to students to children and so we then, are not providing full time employment to these people. Um, it depends based on our need that could that ebbs and flows. If there's a time where we have a quite a few referrals come in, I don't want to say that no, that somebody is not hired full time, but they are not full time from the start of the year to the finish. We will put out positions as needed for and fill our positions first. Let Thank me just um, piggyback in there, Ms. Mack and uh, members of our committee. Just keep in mind, this is the type of like, if we see that we're at that point where we are contracting so much, then that of course triggers us in our budget process to then request um, permanent FTEs, right? Because we have data that can support that. But as you're very familiar with the budget process and Sometimes those things make it all the way through and sometimes they don't. Just to connect well, all and the that's dots. A, a, thank you for bringing that up because that is actually my concern. Mm -hmm. Every year I've been on the board, I have asked for additional speech language therapists, yeah. additional occupational therapists, and additional PTs, and it has not made it all the way through the budget process, and that's why I'm concerned. Yes, yes, and I, I knew exactly where you were going with that, Ms. Mack. That's yeah. why I wanted to make sure like this is you know, it, in the absence of having the FTEs, we need contracted services, which helps us with the data to demonstrate that we need FTEs. But as you know, there is the whole cycle. So thank you as always for helping us advocate for the positions that we need. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parandosi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parandosi, and thank you, Ms. Mack, and congratulations to you for what you're doing with children. I it's keeping found. me young. Oh yeah, it will keep you young. Oh yeah, it'll keep me young because this is a non-stop kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a great okay. thing to do. So thank you for doing that. Uh, any other board members with a question? Um, Ms. Pesture, this is Erin Hager. Um, yes, Dr. Hager. I, uh, I don't, I, for some reason, don't have the hand raise function and I don't know if I'm I feel like everything looks a little weird today, so I may need to pop well, out. Well, it's something that weird to me. That's why I just said, just throw your hand up. <laughs> yeah, call right. out. Thank you. It looks a little different, but um, I just wanted to clarify that this is a contract with the MSD Maryland Infants and Toddlers Program. Is that correct? Ms. Boykin, did you want to go ahead and address that? I, I know you were waiting to. Sure. Um, so, hi. Um, uh, thank you so much for that question. We are considered Baltimore County Infants and Toddlers Program is considered part of the Maryland Infants and Toddlers Program. So we all are considered a part of the statewide program, but these contracts are actually with vendors to support us locally. With vendors, okay. And they would follow the same uh, protocol as the the state Infants and Toddlers Program. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Essentially, Dr. Hager, these are resources that help us support this the program. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, any other board member have a question, uh, Mr. Offerman or Mr. Thomas? 
All righty. Thank you. Now, Thank this you. is the one, is that correct, uh, either Dr. Parandozzi or Dr. McComas, on which we do need a vote since the other one was taken off? Is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. This is the okay. one that we are seeking uh, approval for so that it can then move forward to the contracts committee. All right. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion uh, to move this, to approve this and move it to contracts? Ms. Pasteur, can I ask one more question? Sure, Ms. Ms. I'm sorry. Pasteur. I see on here that this is a five-year contract. So if we do get to the point with the budget process um, and where we have enough staff of our own to fulfill our legal requirements for all of our students. Um, are we obligated for this five-year contract? No, I'm just trying to clarify, we're not, okay. Yeah. No, as, as with all of our contracts, when we bring that forward, we're, we're saying we ask permission to be able to do this, it does not obligate us to do it. If okay. our need changes or if funding doesn't come through to support it, we're never obligated to that to do that. Thank you. So I'll move to accept this contract. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Can I get a second, please? Second, second Thomas. Off me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for the second. Uh, can we any other any other questions? concerns, thoughts before we take the roll call vote. OK, hearing none, uh, Ms. Cox, will you please do a roll call vote? Sure. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mac? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Christian? Mr. Thomas, sorry. <laughs> yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. That has been approved. So thank you very much. And we are now going to go to, um, let's see, this is Dr. Parandozzi again. Now, is this the one, this is the one that's not prepared, is that right? Yes, um, it is. This is the one okay. that was retracted. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, so we are going to move now to the and flat contract. Yes, Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am, thank you. I just wanted to share for the committee, we will, um, once that, um, the contract that is not moving forward at this time, once it's ready, we will bring that to a curriculum committee, of course. I try to line this up in a timely manner so that it's still fresh on your mind when you get to contracts committee. I try not to space it out too far, so. So, okay, our next one is. Um, can I, I yes, ask a ahead. quick question? The contract that we talked about last time that did not come to the board last yes. was it last night. Yeah. Um, it, is that still being worked on? We want it to go from a five year to a one year. That is uh, Miss Shea, if you want to comment on that. Sure, so that's the, the Legends of Learning contract, the science one. It was actually, um, we brought them both together because with the timing, we wanted to make sure our curriculum committee had time to go, but it was never slated for the September contracts meeting. I don't have a specific date of when that's on. It was just our intention because they were related in content to do them together. Right. Um, we, we did take that feedback back about the um, term. So we, if you're going to bring it back, will you, you'll bring it back here with the one year term as opposed to five years? We would be bringing it to contracts next is my expectation with the oh, recommendation with, from the okay. committee about the change in term. But Dr. McComas can correct me if I'm saying that wrong. No, that's correct because we present here just so you have an understanding of the con content need for it. So. OK, but thank you. Sorry. You're welcome. No, that's OK. Thank you for I'm glad we clarified. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Pasher. We're ready to do our next one. Are we ready for Mr. Corns, Dr. McComas? Yes, ma'am. All right, Mr. Corns, you're on flat panel contract. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pasture, uh, members of the committee. Um, I, I feel like a longtime listener, first time caller. So um, we are going to be bringing a contract uh, modification uh, forward in the October uh, board meeting to uh, address a need inside of BCPS for projection devices. Uh, this uh, is going to be in the form of an interactive flat panel display. Uh, so the instructional need 
that we have in BCPS for flat panels uh, are that the elements of effective instruction include uh, presenting of clear learning objectives and uh, putting up anticipatory sets, doing direct instruction or modeling, uh, entering into guided practice and doing some checking for understanding and then following with independent practice. The uh, flat panel really is the assistance that teachers need for utilizing their their laptop technology to uh, both present their objectives as well as their anticipatory sets as and then present models or um, their direct instruction modeling and guided practice. Um, so this this display panel is designed to allow them to uh, address a large group or a, a small group in many cases as the panel themselves will be on wheels and have a multitude of of uh, flexibility in that. Uh, during small group, these devices would also be able to be utilized with all of our student devices from Chromebook to PC at the grade levels so that you could have uh, collaborative groups of students working uh, and using the large display to, uh, to collaborate on work. So in, in the current state in BCPS, we don't have a standard for large group display we have uh, many schools that have locally funded LCD projectors. They've possibly purchased interactive whiteboards, uh, some other display solution, um, but they don't have a replacement cycle attached to them. Um, our school LCD projectors are at varying at various ages, and many of them have begun to fade and dim, uh, unrelated to the uh, lamp life which is a consumable, uh, the projectors are, are just starting to get to a point where they are dim enough that uh, we've got teachers that are saying that their projectors just aren't functional with the lights on their class for a whole group uh, display. So our desired state is to move into a situation where we have a, a flat panel large group display in every instructional area um, and I'm very prescriptive in the term uh, instructional area so that we include things like um, gymnasiums uh, or uh, the cafeteria might be utilized or a space that wouldn't be traditionally uh, called a classroom size um, that we want to fund these panels centrally and support them centrally and that we want to put them on a standard refresh cycle of five years uh, so that we can uh, keep up with uh, replacement and have a path forward to keep this in, in perpetuity. Um, so we are bringing forward a spending authority increase on a contract uh, next month uh, to procure about 7,000 interactive panels. We have 11,000 teachers, but we have about 7,000 identified instructional spaces in our schools. Um, if we uh, if this contract uh, spending authority is approved, uh, DOIT will begin deployment of these panels utilizing a vendor um, in order to have them put out across uh, all of our schools. It is a large number, so it would take um, most of the this school year to deploy them. And uh, we're still working on the order of schools in which who basically who's going to go first versus uh, who will go towards the uh, end of the year. Um, the, the interactive panel is just a display. And so uh, from a professional development standpoint, um, we've, we've had a long uh, history with uh, multiple interactive um, softwares, most recently ClassFlow, that would be able to utilize the touch technology that would be within these panels. They are finger touch, they don't require a pen or a stylus, and um, they are on a fixed height uh, rolling stand that can be set to one of two heights um, with uh, stakeholders uh, to be surveyed um, uh, pending the approval of this so that we could uh, decide how tall to make the, the pre-K versus the 12th grade. And with that, I would take any questions about uh, the flat panel initiative that we hope to implement in BCPS. Thank you, Mr. Corns. I'm going to just go around as I'm pretending I'm seeing people. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Offerman. Do you have any questions or comments for Mr. Corns? Uh, Mr. Corns, uh, how, how uh, you talked about a five year, uh, five year refresh. Yes, sir. Uh, how long is the contract for? 
The spending authority would cover that, uh, Mr. Alfredman. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, what does a, a refresh cycle mean? Uh, I, just I'm, I'm clear on the, what, that, what that means. Sure, no, no problem, Mr. Thomas. So there are two ways in which um, uh, initiatives can be funded, uh, and not just technology, but any. There's a one-time purchase uh, with um, the, the ability to buy something and then have it. But if that thing has a life expectancy, so technology uh, you know, gets outdated, it, it wears out. Um, I, I would even go as far as to say like textbooks, content may shift or, or those kinds of things. So a refresh cycle is where you establish the, the frequency with which you will replace the thing that you procured. So as an example, um, high school laptops are on a refresh cycle. Every four years we replace them en masse and issue new ones. Uh, Chromebooks are on a three-year refresh cycle in BCPS, um, and then uh, on and on. So there, anything that has a, um, I'm going to call it a shelf life, uh, would be a refresh cycle. I'm going to misquote it, but even our buses are on refresh cycles due to the fact that I believe after 12 years, they're no longer able to be used as school buses. So that, that would be how I would define a refresh cycle. Okay, and so with this new, I think it was the extension of the contract, um, would, is the goal like to have one of these uh, flat panels in every one of our learning environments that you mentioned before? Uh, because I know in my experience, I remember I was in kindergarten and I got my first Promethean board ever in my kindergarten class. One day there wasn't one in the classroom and the next day there was one in the classroom and I was like learning to write my name on the Promethean board. And um, but then when I got to middle school, there weren't any of these flat panels or Promethean boards in any of our classrooms. So is the goal to have them in every school? Every school, every instructional space, uh, Mr. Robbins, just and and to that exact point, this builds a level of equity across our schools, so that uh, there is not the uh, the idea that you go from one area to another that has or has something different. This would be a uniform flat panel in every classroom, so that the teachers would be able to grow accustomed to the same kind of panel if they were to be moved rooms. Uh, they're on wheels so they could be moved to a space that maybe wasn't identified early on. Um, and then um, I would wager a guess that that Promethean board that you used in kindergarten may actually still be in that classroom. And okay. so th there are just, uh, there are hardware that were procured one time that we need to replace. And this would be the direct replacement for that exact um, piece of hardware. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Oh, I was, I was just going to ask for the uh, other technology that we still have in our classrooms, like those, like the projectors and the um, old Promethean boards. Oh, what happens to those, uh, to that technology uh, after we, it will be replaced by these flat panels? So there's, there's two, uh, there's two answers to that. The first one is that uh, anything that is uh, a projector or a Promethean board, um, we don't have a Promethean board that's newer than seven years, I believe. So those are, those have uh, outlived their life expectancies. So uh, we're working on a removal process and either disposal or uh, accessing. Now, there are also classrooms in BCPS, um, I'll use the example of Honeygo Elementary, that during the construction project that uh, was to build the new Honeygo, flat panel flat panels were placed in Honeygo in every classroom. So we won't be replacing those because they are new enough to still be relevant and valid. Um, the reason why we list this as a 7,000 7, item with refresh cycle is those devices at Honeygo and our new constructions will age out and they just need to be considered when we go forward with the next round of refresh. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Okay, um, I'll jump in just to ask a question on top of um, Mr. Thomas's. Um, first of all, it's really good that everyone is going to have it because we it was never equitable uh, because we have to struggle just to be able to pay for one of those boards and so you one class might have it or one school might have one etc so um this certainly is uh equitable in all regards also in learn i'm glad the terminology is in uh these learning environments versus looking at the number of teachers we have because we still have many um, schools where teachers are sharing classrooms. So it's about 
having these in those rooms and just the equity, as you pointed out, of if you have to go from one class to another or another, one school to another, knowing that the lessons that you've planned will have the same fidelity, the same integrity as you go from one environment to the next because the same instructional um, um, items will, will still be there, the same instructional accoutrements will still be in each school. So this is a step forward and because I don't want to miss any opportunity to say this word, it is so what is required for Blueprint. Okay, so I'll just throw that in. Those are the kinds of things that um, make teachers feel good about what they're doing in their classrooms. Now, as schools are being built or renovated, um, like right now, as we speak, so you're saying these will be natural. That is configured into cost and, and what is happening in the schools. Is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Uh, Ms. Pastor, I would I would say it is slightly different way at this point. Based upon the outcome of this this contract, uh, currently um, our our schools in their process for construction. So if we build a new school, um, and uh, Mr. Dixit will will be upset if I if I misquote this, but I'll use the term that I'm accustomed to. There's there's funding uh, for uh, F F and E, so furnitures and and furnishings that is put into the construction of a new school. The the principal then identifies instructional needs or furniture types or things of that nature that aren't the brick and mortar of the building. Right. Um, currently, when we put flat panels in new constructions, F F and E money is used for it. What this will actually do is remove the uh, the the need for principals to include that in their FF and E money, and that money could then be utilized from for some other thing during construction. Great, uh, and that's why I wanted that um, clarified. Thank you. All yes, right, uh, Dr. Hager. There I am. Yes, um, I my main question has to do with uh, the initial distribution. So you said that you still haven't identified which schools would initially get the boards um, for this sort of an effort, given kind of the conversation we're just having about how often some schools feel at least that they may get passed over for, for things like this because they're, they don't have the resources to fund them. Will there be a rubric or something that's put into place to ensure that the schools that need them the most will be getting them um, kind of taking more of an equity standpoint as opposed to just checking off every school in the system. Uh, Dr. Hager, so when we 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 try to use um, some thoughtful deployment uh, models uh, when it comes to that. Uh, we do have a, in it, a a rough in inventory of where things are currently, so that that will help to guide us. We also try to make sure that we don't um, uh, exclusively go to one zone or another at one point so that we um, I don't want to say share the wealth but make sure that the entire county feels the um, the the gain um, I will tell you that um, we we had um, just as a, a, a check and this is new information for this group as well but um, we had um, enough funding, uh, a th uh, spending authority and funding that my first step, even if this contract is not a path that the board takes, I've already taken care of the four separate day schools so that those students uh, that engage there will have um, interactive boards um, before the, at, at the first pass within, within uh, very soon. I'll just say it very soon. So um, we absolutely would uh, take under advisement the idea that making sure that um, this that there is an equitable distribution to this uh, as far as the haves and the haves nots. Uh, but um, given given the amount of time we've gone without a systemic uh, display, um, even even at a year, that is uh, a monumental move forward for us. All right, thank you. Before yeah, I go, yeah. as oh, I was say, the only other thing I wanted to say is I wish these okay, things lasted right. longer than five years. That's <laughs> just it's just so disappointing that it's a five year no, turnaround. You know, yeah, Dr. Ager, I am I am I am going to um, pursue a lease for them for five years. Mm -hmm. the, the life expectancy of these boards is longer than that. 
And so as we move forward and see what look, I'm, um, in in all honesty, we're putting them in the hands of students in schools and students in schools and the school environment is a little more rigorous than our home environment. So we are buying a, a panel that is designed to work in schools, but quite honestly, until we get them into the field and really see what is our, you know, how long are they lasting? Um, you know, that will be where we decide is a five year refresh or a seven year refresh more appropriate. Um, but for the funding of this, we're going to start with five and then then go with the refresh after that. Totally understand. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, before I go to Ms. Mack, Dr. McComas, maybe you're better able to answer this than Mr. Corns, but he can jump in. I'm still on Dr. Hager's point because I thought that was, um, I think that is an excellent question in terms of how we are going to uh, send these uh, device, very important, very important devices out to our schools. Um, so I don't, I'm not even going to ask how it's done. I know the people on this committee well enough and know that we then go to the next committee, equity, to say um, for them that we really want to see that the thought goes into not just how they are dispersed around the county, but that there is some sort of metric, that there is a process for taking a look at where our schools are, scores, other things that they have going for them that um, have sort of boosted the instructional models, modalities, that those schools, that that concept, that thinking, and knowing all of you and seeing I, that that will be at the top of your list as you are planning which schools are going to get this device first regardless of whether it's elementary, middle, and high. I heard Mr. Korn say you're not looking at whole areas, but we do know that we have some feeder patterns that would well deserve um, being considered even as a group. So I've said that piggybacking on Dr. Hager's very important uh, concern and question, and I'll throw it to you if you want to comment on that. Please. Sure, I'm happy to comment. What we have done um, typically is um, our team in our educational options that has the blended learning uh, focus team uh, that uh, Dr. Elmendorf is brand new to that role. Uh, typically, the executive director of that team works hand in hand with Jim Corn's position to um, on that process of, of, of surveying, if you will, who has what, where do we need to lay things in to create a more equitable environment? And so it's constantly a work in progress, but uh, you're absolutely right that we need to make sure that we're paying attention so that um, regardless of where a student attends school, that there is an appropriate and equitable access to high quality technology resources and any other resource for that matter. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mack. Well, I hate to jump on the bandwagon, but I, I think I've been on the board long enough now that a topic has come full circle. The very first school visit that I did, um, a teacher brought to my attention that there were not there was not one Promethean board in the entire school. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was going to be a simple process to get an equitable treatment for this school and worked through the process. And the frustrating part was that some schools had had Promethean boards that they were turning back to the Promethean board warehouse and the suggestion was made that this school take the leftovers and use them and long story short they never got anything in fact they used their per pupil schoolhouse budget to have a local local contractor come in and screw whiteboards like the whiteboards that you buy at Staples right. to want to the next to the actual chalkboard and that was the height of the technology that they had in the classroom. So I know each person has spoken about this, but that has always stuck in my crawl that other schools had everything and this school had a contractor 
come in and screw whiteboards that they bought for $20 at Staples so the teacher would have a non chalkboard service surface on which to work. So enough said about that. Um, Mr. Qu um, Corns, you mentioned class flow. What about Elmo? Does this replace the Elmo? Uh, so Ms. Mack, in, in Elmo, um, uh, so uh, I'm trying to uh, make sure that I don't over answer this or under answer it, but it, Elmo as a product line normally refers to a document camera. So this this actually would uh, complement the Elmo because you okay. can plug the Elmo in and, and show it on the board. So yep. that, that's what I wanted to make sure. Um, my other question is you mentioned new schools where this is built into the FFNE or whatever. Yep. Are those new schools also figured into the overall refresh cycle? So at, at on the first pass, Ms. Mack, I don't, I'm not buying a new board for the school that just got a new board. Uh, no, I understand that, but what what is, you know, because what happens is we get six or seven years down the road and what was new is not new anymore. And if they're not in the five year refresh, well, that that's, then yes, they become I'm, the school without. So when I presented you the number, Ms. Mack, I, I gave you 7,000. That is the total number of classrooms, including all of our buildings, regardless of new construction or not. And so in the overall refresh yes i have included those in our projection for the next round when it's time to do this again and those old boards that were new today will be swept out and replaced with the next round i have two more questions and i'm i'm finished um what is so i i heard too in my last visits right before we closed for pan um for the pandemic that because when kids when school started back started back up a lot of our projection devices didn't work because of the lamp light apparently if it got dust on it um the bulb would blow yep are we really going to make a concerted effort to get some of that stuff out of the classroom that nobody uses so so two two parts of that Ms. Mack. uh we um we do uh, do ramp lamp replacements upon school request if the, there's a failed projector but our goal is that this is not to add to any projection system within the classroom this is a replacement of Four. aged yeah so okay. we're going to we're going to take we're going to take that projector out we're going to take that promethean board out with the boom arm all that stuff will come out and we'll roll this this flat panel in as the projection system for the classroom since so th since some of these are so big and it will leave a big gap in the front of the classroom where they are installed are we calculating in this contract the cost to restore a whiteboard in that space or a, a blackboard whatever so is going to be needed Ms. mack in general the promethean mounts were a uh, a u-bolt or a oh, u-bracket okay. round so it, it went above the board not through it. OK, and my last question is, how do we plan to pay for this? Is this grant? Are we using grants, CARES funding or no, straight operating operating budget dollars? No, no ma'am, through judicious budgeting in my office, I've already encompassed the amount of money that it will take to procure these boards and uh, lease them for the next five years. Through the operating budget, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Corns very much anything else pop in anyone's head before we move on yes mr thomas i uh, thank you i believe i actually used one of these flat panels in my latin class um every v day and i've had the same teacher for three years it just got installed two years ago um and it has been a great asset to the classroom and so i'm so excited to uh, hopefully if we can improve this contract to see them being implemented across the system and and so um, the size that we're looking for, just so that you have the numbers, we're looking at a 65 inch interactive flat panel. Um, I have a staff member who works on um, our AV and uh, that is the uh, optimal size for both transportation, uh, mobile safety and uh, display size for our classrooms. So um, that's what they'll look like. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, and thank you very much, Mr. Corns. Uh, we need to take a vote. Can I get? Oops. Can I get a motion to approve Mr. Corns' request 
for these flat panels. So moved, Mac. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman, for your second. Uh, any other questions, concerns? All righty, Ms. Cox, will you do a roll call vote, please? Yep. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, committee members. Thank you, Ms. Cox. All right, Ms. Uh, Dr. McComas, I believe we're down to summer curriculum writing. Is that correct with Ms. Shea? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, so at this point, um, what I'd like to do is Ms. Shea will share with everyone, provide you an update on the work that we did over the summer. Um, as you know, it was in, um, you know, we've been, curriculum work's been very focused uh, as we continue to respond to the pandemic. Uh, so at this point, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas, and thank you, Ms. Pastor. Good afternoon, curriculum committee members. Um, I feel I'm also coming uh, full circle, Ms. Mack, because I presented to you all before the summer to let you know what was coming up, and so I just wanted to circle back and um, give an update. Um, ordinarily, when we are face-to-face, -face, uh, summer curriculum workshops is often an opportunity for you to come visit, and it's a really exciting um, time. So we reimagined it this summer. We did have primarily virtual workshops, um, although we did have some face-to-face -face workshops, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. So next slide. I always want to ground uh, when I come to present with our compass and our strategic plan as part of goal area one, learning accountability and results. We do talk a lot about how student achievement, I know sometimes we think of student achievement as just being test scores, and it's really important that we understand that a part of excellence in student achievement is grounded in having that rigorous and inclusive curriculum. So you'll hear me talk a lot about our efforts to focus on both the rigorous part where it's aligned to standards and evidence based strategies, but also our efforts to ensure that our curriculum is inclusive of the students that we serve. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. I wanted to give you a little bit of numbers. I know especially Miss Mac loves numbers um, and, and share a little bit about it. We did provide workshops for across 12 different content areas, so we often uh, lead with academics, but we do include partners in, for example, the Office of School Counseling um, and in special education to be sure that they have access to those funds at, as well. We did run 98 different workshops this summer, which is an incredible number of workshops, um, and we did hire 400 122 BCPS teachers, um, which is also incredible. Um, and so I thought those numbers were pretty impressive and, and could give you an idea in spite of the pandemic and in spite of everything else that we were supporting with our summer programming. Uh, we did get a lot of work done this summer. That's uh, really important. Um, next slide. So I wanted to pull out a few of the highlights just to remind you of some of what we talked about, just to give you a sampling of some of those workshops. I'm not going to go through all 98 um, in the interest of time. We are on target for the first time in a long time with our agenda, <laughs> and I want to try to, to keep it that way. Um, so we did um, revise our SAT prep courses to establish resources to make them more focused on disciplinary literacy, as we know that that's an important concept across the content. In our CTE, we went through a variety of workshops within CTE. Some of this will reflect on some of the programming that we've talked about. So you know that we've been working on our um, CCRD um, portfolio requirements, and you're familiar with our agriculture program at the middle school, but you also know that we recently um, changed our um, food and nutrition program and our culinary programs to align with ProStart, which is the professional organization that our students are working towards um, accreditation as well as making revisions. So I mentioned about, um, if you could go back, please. I mentioned about um, ensuring inclusivity. Um, we had a lot of work. You'll hear a common refrain in many of our workshops about being more culturally responsive and inclusive. And in engineering, we have a specific, um, some of our national partners have a cultural framework for how you can look at engineering courses in particular through that lens. In ELA, we've come to this committee, and thanks to the support of this committee, we did approve new novels for inclusion in our curriculum that feature diverse um, topics and characters. And that's a reflection of our audit practices. We've been going through our curriculum using a culturally responsive uh, rubric um, and have made some specific revisions based on the results of that audit and the approval of new um, novels to include specific text to support that. 
In ESA, we are incorporating the WIDA standards. These are the um, standards that come to us from our assessment of our English learners. They do provide us with specific can do statements of what our English learners at the different proficiency levels are able to do to make sure that we're incorporating that in our curriculum. For health and PE, I know we came recently with the revisions to grade five and talked about our puberty health indicators, but we also have updates in the high school health education framework, which includes an increase in the graduation requirement. So we know that health education typically was only a half credit. Um, we are actually moving towards two parts. It's actually going to be a full credit. Um, it's going to expand to include a lot more um, health education indicators that also talk about social justice and supporting inclusivity and helping our students develop um, health education at multiple points throughout the high school career. So we know that that distributed practice promotes health education for our students and that's our primary goal. In math, um, we had a lot of new curriculum purchases. Again, with the support of this curriculum committee, we've purchased bridges, we've purchased new calculus, statistics, and geometry textbooks. And so this summer we had workshops to um, help ensure that whenever as um, Baltimore County has an equity policy at the center, although we are moving towards, and I know this was also reflected in um, the audit, um, we are moving towards purchasing packaged curriculum that we know is evidence based and highly aligned. We also have to make sure that we're taking that through the lens of our equity um, intent and focus. And so what that um, work means is even though we have a purchase curriculum, we develop resources to help our teachers use this evidence based curriculum with fidelity for our students. And so sometimes that means developing planning resources or in this case this summer, making sure we can deploy the assessments of that purchase curriculum within our learning management system. Um, next slide. We've been busy in music and dance. We're so excited about our guitar uh, curriculum in grade eight. We're trying to expand music education and increase um, opportunities for students. And we also have our conceptualizing choreography classes um, and as part of our middle school dance expansion, middle school and high school dance. Um, school counseling did some work this summer all across the board in K through 12, uh, working on revisions based on feedback from our school counselors. Science, we're still finalizing our NGSS physics revisions, but also using in grades two through four, we also had a culturally responsive rubric that helped us ensure that we have representation about um, scientists and also thinking about um, in particular areas such as environmental justice and how that can be an example of our students connecting what they learn about science uh, with their community. Visual arts, this was one of my favorites because it's about our pre-K um, literacy through art and this workshop actually brings together early childhood educators, um, reading specialists and art teachers together and included a field trip to the Baltimore Museum of Art. So that was really exciting. So we can have authentic opportunities for our youngest learners to develop those early literacy skills through art. Um, we also made changes this year to our GT pathways again as part of our ensuring inclusion and opportunities for students. Um, we wanted to widen the access for middle school students to have access to GT art so that there are more students have opportunity to participate in that portfolio process should they want to pursue higher level art classes in high school. Um, and then in our world languages, we partnered with our world language teachers and our ESOL teachers to develop courses for Spanish for our heritage speakers. Um, our English learners who come, we want to celebrate their asset. They already speak multiple languages and we want to be sure that they have a pathway to earn that high school credit towards graduation in a language that they have proficiency. So we can take an asset based approach and continue to develop their literacy in their L1 while they're learning English as well. Um, and so that that is sort of an alphabetical <laughs> high level overview of many of the workshops that we did this summer. Um, we're really grateful for the support of this curriculum and for the um, school system support for that. Um, it's a really um, I look forward to the day that we can have the full in person workshops because it's also besides developing content and support for our teachers. It's a tremendous professional learning opportunity for teachers. Teachers develop a really deep understanding of content through the process of developing curriculum. And then last but not least, 
I did want to offer um, prior to the curriculum workshops, we had an opportunity to uh, seek. We often talk about seeking input from teachers um, and having an opportunity for teachers to give us review and feedback as part of that cycle. This year, we also expanded our efforts to have student voice centered in that feedback. So our workshop leads met with and sought feedback from students in a lot of different um, platforms. So some of them did surveys, some of them had focus groups. Um, I have a phenomenal recording of some of our four year olds telling us their opinion about art um, that we can share at another time, um, but it's a really fantastic way for our students to tell us what they need and want to see themselves in the curriculum and also for our teachers um, who are planning in the summer to have that direct input as well. So as you can see, I'm pretty passionate about this work and excited about what we were able to accomplish and I'm certainly happy to take any questions. I think Thank the last you. slide just says questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Three minutes. Yes. <laughs> I'm certainly um, proud of the number or pleased with the number of people who um, participated because you know that has always been the cry. Can somebody help me get a, a, a job on the curriculum committee, please? That's yes. what I want to do for <laughs> summer. Okay. Get, get some, so it was great. Can you just give me those, the, the three categories, those numbers again, please? Yes, well, it was the number of content areas, 12 content areas, 98 workshops, and 422 teachers that we hired. Two. Okay. Thank you um, yes, very much. So now I'm going to start with Dr. Hager. I'm going to go that way. And Ms. Mack, you'll be second. Dr. Hager, any questions or concerns? Um, I don't have questions, but um, my daughter is taking one of the nutrition classes this year that will go toward, I found out about the potential certification and I didn't realize it was brand new this year, but it sounded like a wonderful program. So I'm really excited Great. about that opportunity for, for high school students moving forward. So. Great, and we're excited. Do I have a choice, Dr. Hager? <laughs> She signed up for it all by herself <laughs> and she, I think, mostly just wants to bake cookies, but then she learned that she's going to learn about nutrition too, so. They'll be healthy cookies. They'll be healthy cookies <laughs> they will be healthy cookies and she boiled oh. eggs already and so yeah, it's, it's good. She, she really does love the, love what she's learning though, so it's really Wonderful. great. Wonderful. Thank you. Ms. Mack and then we'll be, that Ms. Mack will be followed by um, Ms. The, no, Mr. Thomas always has a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Offerman and Mr. Thomas will be last. All right, Ms. Mack, you're on. Thank you, uh, Ms. Shea. You mentioned um, the finding in the public works review. Yes. And I was, I actually had a question typed up to ask in the open session that I didn't get to about that. And um, because I am nerdy enough to have read all 756 pages, <laughs> on page 477, there's a statement that every effort should be made to select the most comprehensive curriculum to limit extensive augmentation by BCPS curriculum specialists. That same paragraph goes on to say that using curriculum specialists to augment curriculum is an antiquated process given the money that BCPS spends on purchasing instructional materials. The paragraph ends with, quote, if appropriate curriculum is vetted and purchased, augmentation of curriculum should not be necessary. So what I'm trying to understand is of the efforts that you undertook in the summer, the you know very comprehensive efforts, what percentage of the efforts were augmenting curriculum, which public work says is an antiquated process, and what percent was something else? It's, it's a really good question, Ms. Mack, and thank you for it. Dr. McComas, I saw you turn your camera on, so I don't know if you want to go first or if you want me to answer first. I'll no, you. you go ahead, Ms. Shea. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I was, you know, available to help support sure. this particular. Sure. It, it's a great question, and, and what I want to kind of offer too is that um, it has to be a, a a gradual release, if you will. And so what I mean by that is, and, and I can certainly go back to, because your question was at a percentage and, and I can do the math to help you with that. Some of the areas that I identified don't have. So you saw in the beginning of that sentence you read, it said if, right? So there are some courses that we can't go out to RFI and purchase an evidence-based curriculum. And we are left with purchasing resources and then helping our teachers connect the dots. That used to be universally true. Now we have the ability, so I liken the comparison to bridges. 
We did not write new math lessons. We did not write tons and tons of um, lesson plans for teachers for Bridges because Bridges has that. They've done a phenomenal job of ensuring it's aligned to the major content of the work. They've done the spiraling for us and they have the evidence to support that. So the weaning away, if you will, is that rather than having a workshop where I'm hiring dozens and dozens of math teachers to write daily lesson plans, instead I was able to have a much smaller workshop that was just about refining um, planning documents. So Bridges comes with a lot of resources. Teachers need help with figuring out, OK, where does everything fit together while they're learning to use Bridges? We don't want to just leave them flat, send them 14 boxes of materials and say, Good luck. We want to help them understand as they're navigating the curriculum how to pull those materials together. And then, like I mentioned, Bridges comes with assessments that are in paper, pencil books. We have the opportunity to utilize our learning management system, which is going to allow us moving forward to have robust analytics for that data rather than having every individual teacher have to transfer those assessments themselves to be able to assign it to students. That's a part of where we've done. So over time, our, our vision is that we have more of that and less and less of us having to write daily lesson plans or, or scripting that curriculum because we're able to purchase curriculum that has done that work for us. Um, we just right now have some courses for which that doesn't exist. And, and so there will still be that balance. That's the clarification I needed. But yeah. can we also not require the vendors that we use to include the requisite equity lens that we want to have in our curriculum and our yeah. system? It's can we great. Not, as you said, you took time to go through it to make sure. Yeah. That, I mean, can we not require that? There's a ton of vendors out there. And, and if we say we are only going to buy curriculum that does this, this, and this. Yep. So I Ms. would Mac think that they would jump through hoops to provide us with that. So Ms. Mack, I will tell you it's a both and. We do. So when we put out an RFI, we're able to identify what we're looking for and we center equity in our expectations. What I will offer you is while the publishing companies are working towards that, sometimes it comes back with a sticker, just like everything will say it's aligned to Common Core. And when we actually look at it, it isn't. So yes, and we we do have an expectation. We are pushing on our vendors and publishing partners, but we also know that we ultimately have the responsibility to make sure that if it has not yet the mark, we're making sure to look through that lens for our students. OK, well, thank you very much. That's a, a My pleasure. good answer. <laughs> good, <laughs> I try. Sorry I would just I would just like to also offer that keep in mind the concept of like an evidence based highly rated curriculum is really fairly new. I would say within the last uh, 10 to 5 to 10 years really. So those many of those market products are catching up if you will and that's why we it's important that we use the external uh, resources like ed reports and all because those people are out there helping as Ms. Shea said they're they're saying just because a product is marketing itself as being having an equity lens or being highly aligned to standards um, those external uh, places are doing that deep dive research to help us all of all of the school systems uh, very quickly help identify which ones actually truly do that and which ones don't. Um, and I know Ms. Shea, if you have any comments around like ed reports and how they um, either have built in or do not have built in equity lenses, because I think the other piece to me around the equity lens is the definition, right? And I think this gets back right to Ms. Shea's point around marketing, right? You can have products that say, you know, we have equity built in, but what, what exactly are they defining as their equity, right? right? And does that actually align to our need and our definition of it? So, well, and I will add to that, Dr. McComas, the publishing industry is still predominantly white. That what's yep. published is, is and, and the authors are as well. And so sometimes their efforts to be inclusive will say they have suggestions at the end of the chapter for English learners or they have a footnote that says for students receiving special education. And there's a difference between <coughs> ensuring that all of the math problems and the context for the math problems and the expectations of how that centered in scenarios reflect the lived experiences of our students. That's very different than saying I can check a box that I've included at the end of the chapter. Here's a suggestion for an English learner. So so part of to Dr. McComas's point, 
the industry is playing catch up and, and school districts like ours are pushing on them. We're pushing back on vendors and saying, write something better, write something that is more of high quality because school districts do need to demand it. In the interim, I have to have materials for, for students. So that's why I, I said it's a both and. We do need to push on, just like we've often talked about, I need to push on my university partners to change the reading preparation. Yeah. And in the meantime, need to support the teachers that I'm hiring right now. It's, it's sort of the same idea. Yeah, thank you. That's actually a very good analogy. Thanks, that's two gold stars I got I from that, Matt. I gotta <laughs> hang up now. All right, <laughs> right. Um, before we go to Mr. Offerman, I want to just piggyback on that, uh, the question of what is equity? I've almost gotten to the point that I hate to hear that word because uh, we have just bashed it around, throw it out there and they will come. And we know that it, it it's not so. So it was good to hear as you responded to Ms. Mack that you are processing um, what that means and what it means for our system, because one of the things also um, in recommendations indicated that sometimes we should just stop trying to create a, the, a new wheel or reinvent it, that there are programs out there that meet our needs. But identifying in your answer, I'm thinking I heard that it's not just what a vendor says um, is being met. Uh, but also taking a look at our specific needs in our system. And it's not always about ethnicity or race. Right. And that needs to be put over here that we sometimes get stuck there. I hear Ms. Mack often looking at the numbers in terms of needs, whether it's reading or math. So equity also goes to that. What are the needs regardless of the race of the children. What are the needs that we have? If there's no vendor that does it, then we have, because we know our children, then we have to have those workshops to do it. So that when, uh, again, thank you for that answer. It's not just equity, it's not just about race. It is. Right. It goes to those needs as well. And I think you, you threw that in. So Ms. Mack got two thumbs up for you and I'm going to throw a third one. I'll this take them. The I'm, I'm out um, of thumbs. <laughs> I'll take all of them. Just have to keep saying in this system, um, let's not get stuck on some prescribed definition and understand that there are many layers. If we're going to close the gap, um, which we are now by law required, everybody knows about what I'm speaking, uh, required to deal with. So thank you for that answer. Thank you, Ms. Mack, for those the okay. levels of those questions. So Mr. Offerman, it's your turn. And last, and I know not least, will be Mr. Thomas. Yes. Uh, did I hear correctly that we're moving toward a one credit requirement for health? Yes, sir. OK, I didn't realize that. And secondly, and this perhaps does not pertain so much to your uh, presentation before, but just in general, when when we uh, in our current health uh, process training for students, do, 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 we, uh, do we do we speak about mental health? Yes, we do. We work very closely with the Office of School Counseling. Um, we have um, opportunities to talk about um, wellness overall, um, mental health, as well as stress and, and strategies for handling stress, as well as suicide prevention and, and a lot of other um, personal safety, as well as mental health and um, emotional support. Thank you. That's all. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Yes. Uh, Oh, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ms. Shea, for sharing all of us with us. It was super inspiring to see you. It was amazing. And thank you for all of your hard work with the uh, summer workshops and all of that. Um, my first question is actually expanding off of what Mr. Offerman just asked, because that was what I was going to ask first. Um, for the one credit health class that we're doing, is there conversations about making that possibly a ninth grade requirement in our schools uh, to make sure that you're prepared for the rest of high school? Yes, thank you for that question. So our vision is that the, that's what I mentioned, the one credit, the vision is that they will be two half credit. 
one has to be taken in the 910 grade level band and one in the 1112. Um, partly because we want children to have the inform students to have the information to make healthy choices before they make some some choices and, and have that learning up front. Oftentimes from a scheduling perspective, and Mr. Opperman knows this all too well, it's saved for the end and, and we're thinking about it more in the um, 12th grade, 11th, 12th, and, and oftentimes outside. Mm -hmm. And so we do have um, an impetus to push that up front. We want our students to have that information as they are entering their high school career. So the vision is that this one full credit would be split into two half credit, health one and health two. One would be taken in the ninth or 10th grade. So we give some flexibility for schedules and for schools. And then the second half credit would be taken in 11th and 12th. Um, that is the vision. The hope is that it provides students also with that distributed practice for health education because of the research on how we learn and making sure that we're not checking a box, but really focusing on that. The challenge that I have to center and that we're in partnership with schools is half credit classes are hard to schedule. Master schedulers struggle with them. Staffing can be a challenge. Um, and so we are working in partnership across offices. Um, our My health education team, um, Ms. Roller and Ms. Prozer are incredible. Um, and they have a lot of ideas about working with community health educators and how we might be able to partner to get them certification. How we may be able to certify some of our social studies teachers because of the social justice indicators in the new health framework. Um, we're also working on what are some additional courses that we have across content areas that make good pairs. So in the same way we would love for our students to take health education earlier, we'd also like them to take personal finance and economic theory earlier because a lot of them have their first jobs and we want them to know how to handle their own financial literacy. Um, so we have a lot of um, ideas and opportunities to partner with schools um, to support that piece. Thank you. Oh. One, I guess, concern that I, I've seen, at least at the Eastern Tech community and other schools uh, in CPS, is that a lot of students are opting to take health at the community college level. They're taking the dual enrollment course instead of taking the course in their school, so they wouldn't be getting, you know, the new suicide prevention information. They wouldn't be getting the BCPS provided things. And so, are there any plans to kind of bring students back into the health classrooms in BCPS? Yes, so dual enrollment, of course, is something that we are very proud of, and we try to provide many opportunities for our students. And these revisions that I've mentioned require us to re-examine the CCBC course to make sure that it still meets the requirements and our expected standards. If it does not, then we may make a change that that would no longer be offered. So that's a part of the process. Whenever we get a new framework from MSDE, not only do we have our work to do to see what revisions we have to do, but we also have to meet with our partners in CCBC and say, is that dual enrollment credit still appropriate? And that's not unusual. We did that when we transitioned our GSS science courses. We had the same conversation. Um, we always want to balance opportunities. Again, dual enrollment is an amazing opportunity for students, but our primary focus is to make sure that we're meeting the standards of that curriculum um, for many of the reasons that you just cited. So that is also a part of our practice that we're actually engaging in. I smiled when you started talking because I had a meeting about this yesterday. Um, so this is um, work that's going on right now to make sure that no matter what pathway students take, it has to meet these expectations of that framework. Awesome. Um, and so culturally, culturally responsive was referenced multiple times throughout the uh, 12 different courses that were analyzed in the workshops. Um, is that including LGBTQ plus perspectives? Yes, sir. Yes. So um, if you're interested, and I can certainly work with, through Dr. McComas to share the rubric that we use. It comes from NYU Steinhardt and talks about um, representation of a lot of different identities, including LGBTQ um, students, as well as um, different race, ethnicities, religious backgrounds, and different lived experiences. Um, it also talks about um, reviewing our curriculum from a social justice lens and how we're empowering students to think about that. So it has three separate categories. Um, we started with one that was a literacy based framework and then the organization that had published that developed a STEM one as well. So we were able to then revisit our math and science courses um, and many of our like our visual arts team took that initial rubric and then applied it to the lens of their content. So I'm happy to share that with this group through Dr. McComas so you can see exactly the lenses that we're looking through. 
I think it may be if the committee um, wills it, it that we actually come and do some presentation on that as well. Oh, I would love uh, that. Because <laughs> I think the, the rubric is great and you can certainly uh, do your research online and look it up. Um, it's easy enough to Google and look up, uh, but I think it's always it's a worthy conversation, I think, for uh, our committee uh, purposes to really understand how we are uh, it, deeply analyzing our own curriculum, make sure that is relevant and uh, responsive to to our actual student population. So I think we will add that um, if that's agreeable to the committee members. Um, we can add that to one of our um, upcoming presentations. That would be great, Dr. McComas. Thank you very Absolutely. much. We that would love would, that. That would be yeah. that would be wonderful. Um, I see that um, we have three other staff members on here who have not spoken. Um, would any of you want to add to anything about which we have spoken today before we come to an end? I Dr. think we Thomas, can, any we of can them? call on, yeah, we can call on them since the live, I think Mr. Corn said this particular platform doesn't have the hand raise uh, um, function. So uh, Dr. Holmes, do you have anything to add for the good of the cause today? No, I was um, getting excited with and for Megan getting her stars. Uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm like, uh, and Mr. Thomas looks like he's raising, giving you another star. I'll so take him. Hey, you on the walk of fame today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. So uh, one thing that I will say is I am definitely interested because I was not here doing the uh, curriculum writing um, process. So definitely Dr. McComas, I'm interested as well in going through the process and uh, seeing the rubric. I was just about to text the group and say, I'm interested in seeing the process and going through the rubric um, as well. So I think that would be a, an outstanding treat. Appreciate uh, the engagement and, and the questions from the board members to help us think uh, deeper and wider about what we're doing in curriculum and instruction. Absolutely, thank you. And then uh, Dr. Wistead, do you have anything to add? No, Friday? no, make Dr. Wistead last, please. Oh, okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, then I'll, Dr. Elmendorf, do you have anything? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, my camera is not working. I'm on an old laptop um, as my new one is being, um, is getting some programs put onto us as we speak. So um, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Korn said earlier, that our two departments will certainly be working together to make sure that any hardware and software is, um, distributed in an equitable manner, and we're definitely considering the instructional needs of the students. That's kind of where my department falls into place is making sure that the, the tools that are in the students' hands are being used in ways that are enhancing the instructional program. Um, so I just want to reassure, reassure this group that we will work together to make sure that um, those things are be, being done really well in the schoolhouses when, the, when those materials come in. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Ellen Dorf, I want to uh, thank you. I just sort of feel like we've become email friends. Um, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for everything that you're doing, trying to get our students placed where they need to be and working with our parents, whether it's for um, virtual instruction or their face to face. Uh, so I just wanted to publicly thank you for the work that you're doing. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Dr. Wistead, before you make any comments, because I'm on this tear, for those who are not real clear, Dr. Wistead is our blueprint person for our county. And with all that she already has on her plate, she has a new mountain because she has the, in many ways, spearhead how we move down that straight and narrow, and we do have a plan that needs to come out. So I know all departments are working or will be working uh, to make sure that plan gets out by the end of this school year so things start moving. So Dr. Wistead, I personally want to thank you for the work that you will be doing um, where blueprint for Maryland's future is concerned. It's a heavy load. Um, and I know you have some good people supporting you to that end, but I wanted to personally thank you for it. 
So now if there's anything you want to add. Please. Oh, thank you. Um, nothing to add on, on the topics that we talked about today. I think that my teammates pretty well covered everything, but yes, thank you for the, the commendations for the blueprint. And um, yes, I've already participated in meetings with MSDE. I regularly participate in meetings with the internal team um, and with our county executive partner, Jennifer Lynch. So thank you for the comments. Oh, thank you. And Dr. McComas, before we go, I sort of mentioned it at the board meeting. There was no real follow up, but I really need to say about the um, the efficiency report that I've heard one or two folks say that we don't have as a board um, goals. And I always uh, take a front to that. Um, so I want to thank because it was with under the board a commendation. I want to thank Ms. Mack who um, chaired our goals committee. Dr. Hager was on it, Ms. Rowe was on it, and I was on it. And so I want to thank you um, for being on that committee and the things about which we spoke today and we always speak, go right to the heart of those goals, not to micromanage, but to make sure that we stay um, in the present with where our children are going. This was a crazy year, so no one got a real chance to put them into action because we didn't have the testing, so much we didn't have. But I really wanna thank those uh, the couple of you who are on this committee for that and Ms. Mack for um, chairing it and for the curriculum and instruction people who just uh, keep us steady and take us where we need to go. And what an awesome committee because we have uh, Dr. Wisted who is on this committee who will be able to further guide us um, our goals are still intact, Ms. Mack and Dr. Hager. They are still intact and very much real. And we're going to see just how important it will be for us to keep our eyes on that prize so we can all keep our eyes on the prize, which is just the growing success of our children, getting staff giving them the best opportunities, Mr. Corns, making sure we are getting the kind of technology. So I am so proud of this committee and how awesome we are because all roads come back to us, whether anyone likes it or not, but everyone is doing a wonderful job. And I just wanted to end today because we actually have 40 minutes before the next committee to say thank you to all of you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Pesher, uh, and thank you truly everyone um, who's a member of our committee. Um, we, you know, I always say this is the best committee and it's the best committee because it's the core mission of our organization and what brings every one of us to work every day and to board meetings every time and every committee meeting. Um, so thank you, Ms. Pesher. I just echo everything uh, you just said. So uh, again, thank you all the committee members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Offerman. We agree. And um, I am happy for a change to give you some time back before equity committee. Maybe this makes up against all those times we ran a little over, Mr. Corns. Uh, so please take a rest. We will reconvene many of us in the equity committee uh, at I think four o'clock. So yeah. thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you, Mr. Corns. Mm -hmm. You're all welcome. Have a great and day. We are adjourned. All right. Craig, let me drop over to my laptop. I'll be right.